great full house tonight. Um, basically, in a nutshell, motion design is graphic design, including time and space. So treat everything like graphic design. Like you want good layout and let me put this up here. There we go. So you want to have a good layout and just like print design, I imagine you've all done print design, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah. So with print design, you have to have any images with your print file. So with After Effects, like if you use any videos or photos, you have to include that with your After Effects file. So just let you know that up front and just store everything in the Google Drive folder I made you. Um, one thing I like about motion design is you can play to your strengths. If you're good with typography, you can do some amazing type animations. If you're good with hand-drawn stuff, you can use hand-drawn. If you're a great photographer, you can use photography or video. It's whatever your comfort is, is the best way of learning along, you know, the path towards learning more. But, you know, you can basically do anything with motion design. So I'm very open-minded about it. The only hard things that are like big nose in here is do not use any copyrighted music because first off, if you do that, your video won't be, you won't be able to share it on social media. You'll just get struck down and companies want to see that, you know, how to find royalty free music. So it's best to just find royalty free music off YouTube. It's free. And the other thing is, so the two assignments revolve around movie and TV studios, like uh, animating a logo or then doing a title sequence or an intro sequence. You cannot use existing properties. You can't do like Harry Potter 9, you know, oops, I did it again. It's got to be something you came up with. Like you could you could be inspired by Harry Potter, but you can't brand it as Harry Potter. Or use the Harry Potter fonts. Does everyone understand that? Uh, so. I'm going to pull up the internet here real fast. And what I do, my go-to, and uh, so if I go to YouTube right here, audio library, there's a way of access, uh, getting to this from your channel. There it is down there, audio library. So that pulls up this. Now, if you're using something off YouTube, click this little hamburger, attribution not required. Otherwise, you'll have to credit the artist and make sure it's in your description and all that. This way, you just got your bases covered. And then you can just go by genre, mood, duration. But right off the bat, I've got all my bases covered. I can use any song from here, however I like, and I don't even need to say who it was, what it's called, or where I got it from. Attribution not required. My bases are covered right there. So I'm gonna click out of there, and I'll click out of there. And we'll go right here. Now, another thing you do, and I know I misspelled royalty free. You want royalty free and copyright free if possible. Some of these other sites, they have, um, you have to pay for the music. So, you know, it's what you feel like doing, but any song that's from any artist will be copyright and rights protected and not be royalty free. So, you know, like say you like the guitar solo to something by Hootie and the Blowfish. You can't use that because it's a copyrighted song. I hope that helps clear it up. Yeah. Even if you're grabbing part of it, the I think it's the five second rule. If you have five seconds or less of audio, you will not get striked and you could do that. That's why when they're doing little clip shows, it's small little clips here and there, and they don't play the full song or else they'll get a copy strike. So that's the way that that goes. That's why, like I said, if you just do royalty free and then no attribution required, you get it through all those loopholes. What I can do since I've got everyone here, I can go over just the real quick workflow that you'll do for the rest of the semester. Um, basically, once you start up after Effects, it's a blank slate. And, you know, don't think of it as like something intimidating. Um, the project panel right over here, you'll see them light up in blue, whatever you click on. So this is the project panel. This is where you organize all your artwork and things that you import, like photos, videos, music that goes in here. The composition, this is what the viewer is going to see. And then down here's your timeline where you arrange 
your artwork and then when you want your animation to happen. So I'll do something very fast and easy. And also this is great to have everybody here for this. Now I click new composition right here in the middle. You could always get there by going composition, new compositions, new composition as well. And I'll just call this test. What we're going to be doing, one second, let me zoom in. We're going to be doing 1920 by 1080. And that's basically your Hershey bar TV settings. That's 2K resolution. Now, based upon what you're doing, if you've got like video clips or, you know, stock stuff you found on the internet, you might be at 2997 but 24 frames is good for the internet where it's like, you know, a good frame rate and it'll be pretty smooth. So 1920 by 1080, 24 frames. And then just make sure your start time code is set to zero. That just means the beginning of the timeline is zero. Now down here, duration, all of the assignments are between 10 and 15 seconds. So if we're doing, let's say 10 seconds for the first assignment, if that's what you choose to do, time code goes frames, seconds, minutes, and then hours. So if I just typed in 10, it would only be 10 frames long. So you would hit 10 period zero zero to get 10 seconds. And I'm just gonna make my background color black, then click OK. So 1920 by 1080, 24 frames, and however long your animation is gonna be, 10 to 15 seconds. You can go longer, but you know, I advise having quality over quantity because when you're showing your reel to studios, they're only gonna watch a couple seconds at a time and, and skip ahead through your reel. So no one's gonna sit down and watch two minutes straight of one animation. It's not gonna happen. Okay, so we're all set up. This is what the viewer is gonna see. It's empty. We've got your selection arrow, just like in After Effects and Photoshop. The hand tools for moving around inside the composition. Magnifying glass zooms you in and out. I hold down option to zoom out. You can also zoom in and out here. Do not hit command zero. Command zero will hide some panels and then you gotta go and hit command zero again to show them again. The shape tools are right here if you're working with simple geometric shapes or you could draw and then your type is here. So I'm just gonna use a square like that. And I'll show you the workflow that you should use. And this is the way it'll go for the rest of the semester. First thing you wanna do is think about what you wanna do and then how you're gonna get there. So I'm gonna have this square move across the screen stop at the center, come down a bit, spin around, and then go off the screen. So I figured out what I wanna do. Now, the four pillars of motion design, and this is all in the lectures, you know, I'm just going over it because you're all here. You can twirl down any layer by clicking these arrows. And when you twirl down the transform, you'll see position, scale, rotation, and opacity. These are basically what I refer to as the four pillars of motion design. You can do a lot of creative, interesting animation if you focus on position, scale, rotation, and opacity, get good at it, and then start building up your skill set from there. So moving across the screen, that's position. Moving down, that's position. Rotation, is it spinning? And then position, is it going down again? So I figured out what I'm going to be doing. I'm gonna want my square to start off the side of the screen, like I said before. So I'm gonna click position, and that's gonna be my first keyframe, is right there. You need a minimum of two keyframes. So that's set. And I just move my playhead to however long I want the animation to be, the change. And you could either slide these numbers here, that's down, this one's side to side, or you can click and drag. If you hold down shift, it'll lock it to side to side or up and down. So I have it moved to there. And there's my motion. First step is move the playhead to where you want it to start. 
click the stopwatch that you want to animate, move forward in time, and then make a change. So I had it here, then I wanted it to go down a little bit. So I'll move forward a little bit more. This time I'll use the numbers to slide it down. And then I'm going to have it spin around and go off the screen. So if this is where I want the spinning to start, I move the playhead to where I want that to start. Let's say right here. Let's go a little before there, just for the fun of it. Right there. Then rotation. And I move forward. The first number, let me zoom in. The first number is complete rotations. And the second number is a number of degrees. So if I just wanted to tilt it 15 degrees, I could click here and type in 15. But I'm going to want it to spin around, let's say, two times. So it's going from zero spins to two full spins over that amount of frames. I'm going to zoom out. And then I want it to go down off the screen, so I move forward again. Well, here's a little trick. I don't want it to start moving until here. So I'm going to put a keyframe there by clicking the empty diamond over there. Then move forward a little bit, and then I'll just move it down. And here's a preview of that real quick. It's thinking about what you want to do. Move the playhead to where you want it to start. Click on the appropriate stopwatch or stopwatches. Moving forward however long you wanted that change to take and then changing something. You just keep going on and on and on with those changes. Let me delete this. I'll give you another example. I'll do a star this time. And I teach with simple shapes just so that you can learn the concept faster rather than watch me draw something beautiful over the course of an hour. You get more learning and you could ask more questions because once you understand the concept, you could apply it to anything. So if I want this star to swing back and forth like a few times, well, that's going to be rotation. Now, we've got our playhead to where we want the animation to start. And you could get shortcuts to these by hitting P for position, R for rotation, S for scale, and T for transparency. So you could either hit the R key or just twirl down to there. So I know I want to start rotating, but here's something that I want you to focus on, a new step to it. Animation will be influenced by where the anchor point is. The anchor point is this little thing right here. And it's just like in Photoshop and Illustrator. I'll show you what I mean by that. This tool right up here is called the pan behind tool. And you use it to move the anchor point. If you hold down command or control, you can snap it to a center point or an edge or a corner. You know, so if I put this right here at the top, and I start rotating it. It's going to swing from side to side like a pendulum. That's where the motion is being influenced from. If I hold down control or command and I snap it to the center and I do rotation, it's going to spin around like a propeller blade. Where the anchor point is influences the animation. Okay. So if I want it to swing side to side like a pendulum, I'm going to put the anchor point where I want the hanging to take place like this was pinned to the wall right there. That's what the anchor point does. So I can click my stopwatch for rotation, go forward a little bit. Remember this number over here is degrees and that's full rotations. So I went about 18. Now I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Go forward a little bit, a little more. And that's going less and less and moving them closer as it happens. You could have as many keyframes as you want, but you need at least two keyframes to do anything. And then you just hit the space bar to preview it. Let me delete this layer. And I'll use a circle. The reason you need two keyframes for anything, let's let's do position again. Well, it's over here right now. And if I move my playhead, 
and I don't add another keyframe, it's still there. So I need to say something happened between here and here and then decide how much. So I use my arrow tool and hold down shift and say, okay, well, over this amount of time, it moved that distance. Or let's say with transparency, it's there. I click the opacity, I move down, and then it faded off. What well, has to go from being visible to invisible for that to happen? That's why you need a minimum of two keyframes to do anything with motion design. And they need to be at least one frame apart because there needs to be at least that amount of time for something to change. Any questions about any of that? Because like I said, I go into it in great detail in the lectures. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll show you that. Um, let's do some text. Whenever you use a tool up here, you're gonna see the properties change over here. So just like any of the other Adobe programs, you can edit it with the character panel. Okay, let's say I want this to slide in off the screen and then fade off. So for it to slide in, the first thing is going to be position. And I move my playhead to where I want that to start. Let's say right here, I'll twirl down and I'll click position. Well, I said I want to start off the screen, so I'll just move it off the screen and there we go. So I say, how long is it gonna take for that to happen? Let's say this long. Then I move it to where I want it to end up. Like that. So that's the first part. Now, anything else I want to happen, I can have happen any time I want. I'm the designer, I'm in control, I can do whatever I like. So if I want right about here, if I want it to start scaling up and then scale down by the time it gets there, I go, okay, well, right here, I want to start scaling up. And then I'll say, well, how long do I want that scale up to take place? Well, I'll move to about here and I'll scale up about that much. Now, what's the next thing I want to do? Well, I want it to scale down when it reaches, say, here. So I can even type in a number and change it there. These keyframes don't line up. They don't have to because I'm the one saying what happens and when it happens. Okay, it's up to you as the designer to find the rhythm and the pacing for the motion you want to create. So if I want this to be up for, let's say a second, I move ahead a second and then I can say, okay, well now it'll fade off. So here's where I want it to start. Fade off would be opacity. How long do I want that to be? Let's say one second and I fade it off. It's what's going to happen when you want it to happen and how you want it to happen is what will make you a successful motion designer. So think about what you want to do. Move the playhead to where you want the motion to start or the change to start. Make sure your anchor point is in the right spot to get the motion you want. Then click on the stopwatch you want. Move the playhead, make a change. And when you make that change, you automatically have your second keyframe added in. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, like I said, yeah, no problem at all. Like I said, that's why I'm here. I want you to learn from your lab time. You can do what you want as long as it makes sense. If you can justify it or come up with a reason for it, you know, like, uh, let me show you something here. I'm just gonna make an oval just for the fun of it, something different. Okay, so there's the oval and So we've got the word logo. All right, let's put it right here. Now, if I've got, the more layers you have, the more flexibility you have as an animator. Like if this is all one layer, I can't do much, but if they're separate, I can have this scale in, fade up, do whatever, and have this layer do something different. They're 
separate from each other. They're like, they're like layers in Photoshop. I've got full flexibility over what's going to happen. But one thing I want you to think about is let's try the align panel right over here. I'm going to center these and then horizontally center them. Okay. And then let's just move them to about here. All right. Graphic design is part of motion design. So let's pretend this is your logo. Okay. You want it to look good. You want it to make sense where it's in relation to everything on the screen. But when you're animating in the individual pieces of your logo, you want that to make sense. Like if I've got this circle here and I want the text to come in, depending upon where it is in relation to the circle, that's how things are going to animate in. Like, let's say I want the text to fade in. So T for transparency. And I want it to start fading in right about here. So if it's fading in, that means it's not there. And we'll have it fade in to about there. I'll change it to 100. Okay, so there's our fade in. Now, when this comes in, depends upon Let's say this logo, if I have this start sliding in while the text is still fading up, it might look weird. So I might want to think about the timing of this second element that I'm adding to my scene. So maybe I might want to wait for it to be like almost fully faded in and I'll hit like S for scale. Set it to zero. We'll go scale up to 100. So that's going to fade in, and then that's going to come in like that. And then I can think of what the next thing I want to have happen is, you know, because the logo faded in, the next element came in. But, you know, think about the timing and the rhythm and what's coming in and make sure it makes sense. Because sometimes you might have elements that rest on each other. Like if I've got a coffee cup in my hand, it would look weird if the coffee cup faded on the screen and there was no hand there to hold it. You know what I mean? Whereas like if I had, that's actually a good example. I'll show you in a second. And while we're here, so when you're doing Google, hit tools, Usage and rights, Creative Common, you know, because you don't want to go using copyrighted images. And if you want transparent stuff, you know, you go to color, transparent. And if you need something that's usable, I usually look for large for file size. Okay, so let's try and find something. That we could use like this. And hopefully that PNG tile is not there. But I have a feeling that gray is going to be there because that's usually the way things go. And uh, let's do the hand sanitizer. Why not? This is a great example. So if I want to import any artwork, I can double click in the project panel in an empty spot or go file, import, file, just like most of the other Adobe programs. So here's the hand sanitizer. There's the hand. I'm going to hit import. All right. We've already created our sequence right here, the composition. So I'm going to put the hand in and then I'm going to click and drag and put the hand sanitizer in. All right, this is good. I just randomly picked these. So the hand sanitizer is way out of proportion to the size of the hand. I'm going to hit S for scale. And don't forget, I could also just twirl down and get to scale there too. But you can exaggerate. If you want to exaggerate, make it deliberate. Animation is all about exaggerating. It doesn't have to be realistic, but it has to look intentional. Okay. So that's about good. Um, if I hold down shift, I can select both layers 
move them together. All right, so this is what we want to end up with, all right? Now, I showed you moving forward in the timeline. You can also work backwards. So if this is the layout we want, and then let's say we want it here. And add in some copy. All right, you got your leading line being created by the image. These fingers are taking your eye to the text, just like your basics in typography and graphic design. Think about your layout, the relation between this type and these fingers. You want it to look pretty, you want it to make sense. Is everyone with me so far? Okay. So we've now got three layers, three elements here. All right, so what I would say makes the most sense, if the hand sanitizer drops and stops there, it's not gonna make any sense because there's nothing to stop it. This is an example of animation hierarchy. So with graphic design, you've got information hierarchy, like what's most important? Well, this is high contrast. I got black background and the white logo and the all the leading lines are taking you to on sale. Well, what's on sale? Why this hand sanitizer is on sale. Well, what do you use it for? For your hands. That's my information hierarchy. Now my animation hierarchy is gonna be, when is this coming in? When's that coming in? And when's that coming in? When are they coming in? How are they coming in? How are they gonna resolve themselves? So here's how they're gonna resolve themselves. Let's say this is a four second animation. Now we'll do three seconds with one second of it being on the screen. Here's where I want everything to end up. And let's just do, for the hand, we'll do rotation. I want the hand to swing up, okay? But look at this, let me hide the other layers to make it easy for you. Remember, here's my anchor point, right there at the center of the palm, it's at the middle of the layer. That's not where the arm moves. If your arm moved like that, go to the hospital. So I grab my pan behind tool and I move the anchor point to there. So now if I hit rotate, that's more realistic. Okay. And I'm getting a little bit of breaking up here of the image. So I'm going to watch how much I have that tilt up. Let's say I'll set it back to zero. This is where I want it to end up. So I'm going to click my stopwatch. Then I'm gonna go backwards a little bit. And let's say to right about here. If I click the empty diamond, I get an empty keyframe. So I can make my change, let's say about that much. Like that, and I'll move this to have it go in a little bit faster. Now let's move this down a little bit. My hand comes up. And we'll have the lotion drop here. So I move my playhead, I hit P for position, click on the stopwatch. Let's say as the hand is almost done catching it, I'm gonna move it up off the screen. So now the hand's moving up as the lotion's dropping, or I should say the hand sanitizer's dropping. And then lastly, we've got this on sale. Well, what would I want to do with that? I could have it come out from behind the arm or I could have a fade in. There's so many things you could do. Um, but what I'm going to do just for the fun of it is you saw how to keyframe. Does everyone understand? Move the anchor point, move the playhead, click on what you want to move, move to how long you want that change to be, then make your change. Does everyone have that? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, the anchor point, you move that first because based upon where the anchor point, that's what's gonna influence your motion. Like I move the anchor point back here to where the arm bends so that the hand moves naturally. 
it looks like the arm's moving because the anchor point's over here. That's where the rotation's coming from. So that's first. I'm like, okay, I gotta fix that so it rotates properly. Move the anchor point, then move the playhead to where you want the motion to start. Then you click on the play on the stopwatch for what you want to animate. In this case, it was rotation. Then you move the playhead to how long you want that change to take. And then you make your change. The closer the keyframes are together, the faster the change will be. The further apart they are, the slower that change will be. Mm hmm. Okay, so I showed you the basics of keyframing. Um, there are built-in presets in After Effects. I suggest you don't use them when you got such a little bit of wording. But just an example, just to show you something fun. Um, here's the effects panel. You could always search for something like turbulent noise or turbulent display. So you can just type in to find something, or you can just go to a folder. So I'm going to go to animation presets and then text. I want it to animate in. Let's do flying with a twist. So for these presets, wherever the playhead is, is where that preset will start animating. So I'll do drag that onto there. Typewriter. There we go. All right, fine. I'm going to reposition that back to where it was. There we go. So that's an example of just thinking through a basic animation and coming up with an animation hierarchy, making everything nice and laid out and making sense about how it comes in, when it comes in, what it's doing, like such. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So, you got that. Now, one thing you could do, normally get into this like a week or two from now, but I wanna dive into thinking through your animation. Here's the impact. You'll sell this impact more if there's a little bit of what we call overshoot, meaning going, the hand will dip down a little bit from catching it and then rest back up. So what I can do is, this next part's gonna be a bit more advanced. I don't expect anyone to, you know, pick up on it right away. I'm just showing you how to push this. You'll work your way up to here. So right, right before the impact, right here, I'm gonna split these layers. Now to split the layers, this is how long the artwork is on the timeline. This stretch that you're seeing right here. If I go edit, split layer, I've now split them. Okay, and I can just change my layer stack order just to keep everything nice and neat. Here's my hand sanitizer. If I parent this to the hand, what that means is when this hand moves, this is gonna move with it. It's like if you're holding a ball in your hand and you lift your hand up, the ball is gonna move with your hand. There's two ways to parent. You can grab this pick whip that you're seeing right here and drag to the layer you want or you could use the drop down and choose it. So I just told the computer, I want this hand sanitizer to move with that hand. So if I go and add a keyframe here, go forward a few frames, bring it down a little bit, go back up. Let's have it go up a little bit in the opposite direction and then have it rest back at zero, oops. Say right about here. So 
So it goes down a little, comes back up. That's a bit much. So I could just change that. I'm using the up and down arrow keys to uh, go smaller amounts. That's a little bit better. See like that nice little jiggle because there's some weight from that and it adds a little bit of interest. Like such. It's just thinking through your ideas and pushing them, okay? This is just an intro tonight. I just wanted you to see this ideas of thinking of it as graphic design, adding in time and space, making sure your final image makes sense, and then how things animate in makes sense. You can always keep pushing your animation. And that's what I'm here for, to teach you about that. It's not me critiquing you or criticizing you. It's me helping you become a better motion designer. If you get good at motion design, that sets you apart in the field of graphic design. It puts you in a different echelon. And by the end of the semester, you're going to learn motion design and video editing, and that'll really help you out in the job market because it's a much needed skill set these days. So I'll bring it back to something simple. I'll just create a new composition. And we'll use a star. And it's just a reminder. So first thing you do is move the playhead to where you want the motion to begin and then move the anchor point to where you want the motion to go. So if I want this to swing from the top, I grab the pan behind tool and I move my anchor point. Always move the anchor point before you keyframe animate or else things will go wrong. You know, so you move the anchor point first. And then I said, well, I want to rotate. I've got like hour long lectures that I go much slower and I explain things. The slides are there. I just figured some of you may not have had time to look at the lectures yet. So I'm just giving you a quick you know, preview while I'm here. Y yes, every week, watch the lectures. And so, all right, so here we're back. I'm going to do this real quick and then I'll bring up the syllabus. So first step is always move the anchor point with the pan behind tool. Move it to where you want the motion to be influenced from. Then you move the playhead and click on the stopwatch that you want to animate at that time. For me, it's rotation. I move forward and I make the change I want. And like I said, you need at least two keyframes. You can have as many or as little keyframes as you want, but you need a minimum of two and they need to be at least one frame apart because it's time and space. Okay. And your keyframes don't always have to line up. Like I could have something else happening here. I could have the scale changing out of sync with this. It's whatever you want to do, just as long as you make it look deliberate and thought out. Like such. It's always move the playhead, click on what you want to change. You don't always have to completely fade something out. You know, it's what you want as long as it looks deliberate. It's about getting the look you want and making it look intentional. Like that, you say, oh, it's flickering, but it's still there because it's not fully disappearing. All right. Yeah, so each week, watch the lectures. There's only two assignments. The first one is an animated logo. 
and has to be for a movie or TV company. And that will be due. All the important stuff is in red. First homework is due 10.04. So what I want you to do, yes. Yeah, no problem at all. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I was going to just say. Perfect, I love it. No, that's great. I want you to be engaged and I want this to be interactive. So ask away, yes. I was just gonna say each week, submit storyboards or you could type up I was thinking of this happening then that happening as long as I have an idea you can do sketches by hand and just take a picture of it with your your camera phone and email me the photos of your storyboard and I want to stress this you are not being graded on your storyboard no one's going to see your storyboard except for you and me the storyboard is just to get the idea out of your head and come up with an idea of what's going to happen and when okay so yeah just check in with me each week you know make sure you've got stuff the best thing to do i've said this every semester and i'll keep saying it every semester if you use lab time to actually animate and troubleshoot and get my input you'll have quality work but a lot of students use lab time to actually start looking for photos and images when they should have been doing that before they even got to lab time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like if you use lab time to actually animate and troubleshoot, you'll be much better off than just walking in here and using the time to start looking for photos. Hope that makes sense to everybody. Okay, great. Yeah, and like I said, YouTube was just down tonight. Normally it'd be through YouTube, but I'm going to, like I'm recording this instead of Zoom so that I can access it quicker. And I'll turn around, I'll chop it up and I'll send it up for everybody to, to have. Um, and along with that video that I submitted, you know, just a reminder, that's one thing I don't like about Zoom. It gets in the way. Um, well, I've got everyone here. If you just go to Canvas and then the course, uh, I'm out. Oh, well. Um, do I still have it? Yep, I do. All right. Here's the fast way of doing it when you don't want to waste everyone's time. So I'll zip ahead. Okay, so in Canvas, if you click on Files, then go to Art 228, and then the Virtual, that's where everything is. All the slides and After Effects files for the lectures are in here. The video links are right here for the lectures. There's the rubric. Bonus material, that's just stuff that used to be in the class, but I took out, but you can still learn it for free. There's the syllabus. And reference files down here, that's where you can see past students' work to get inspiration from. Plus, I've got PDFs that you can use if you've got, like, you know, if you're stuck on something. So it'll help you, you know, possibly inspire you. So. There's lots of stuff that will help you out. So think of a logo. That's first and foremost. It has to look good. A good, clean, professional graphic design logo for a movie or film company that does not exist. Then think about the animation hierarchy. How's it coming in? When's it coming in? 
to the resting image. That'll be the first homework assignment. The more layers you have, the more flexibility you have with your animation. This hand sanitizer was able to move on its own because it's a different piece of art than the hand. I've got more range of options and then I tied them together so that when the hand caught it, there's a little bit of a dip and a jiggle there, some overshoot of the position and the rotation. So like I said, break it down. You know, I needed a full hand that was empty so that it wouldn't look weird if I photoshopped out this hand sanitizer. I thought about what I wanted to do, the order it came in and how I wanted it to look when it was all done. And you'll do the same thing with your logo. Try not to use copyrighted images. Don't use copyrighted music. You know, it's always best to use your own artwork. It's your way of showcasing to employers what you can do when you're out of school. So, like I said, I always focus on people having professional work to help them in the job market when they're done school. Because if your work doesn't look good, you shouldn't have it in your reel. But hopefully we'll get to the point where everybody's work looks good. Any other questions? Okay, I see what you're saying there. Okay, right. Okay, that's sort of along the s lines for the second assignment. What this, what this is, is think of a logo for a movie or film company, like DreamWorks, the kid sitting on the moon fishing, or, or Pixar, the lamp bouncing across the screen. So you got that in your head? Now you're gonna think of your own company and do an animation for it. Yes, it's for the company that would make the movie or the TV show. You, yeah, no, I'm glad you're here and you're asking those questions. Yeah, so that's what you're doing. You're coming up with an animated logo for a, a made up film or video company. And while I've got your attention, use short words. Don't go using big words because then you've got to animate all those letters and make it look good. So make it easy on yourself. You know, like if you called something like, I, I don't even know, like I, I've had students use incredibly long words and it just went bad on them. Most of them, if you look at the stuff, it's short words that are just fast and easy to animate on because you're going to be thinking about you've got weeks to do this. So every letter of your company should make sense how it comes in, when it comes in and the overall presentation of it, you know, like are the letters going to draw on? Are they going to animate themselves on like they're alive? Are they going to grow out of the ground? That's up to you as the animator to come up with. But the more things you've got going on, the more you've got to make look good. So you want enough flexibility, like with this hand being empty and that bottle, that's manageable. But if each finger was its own piece of artwork, I'd have, you know, like seven things to take care of there as opposed to two. Be smart about it. Hope that helps. And like I said, you could look at the other students' work and see what they did for their logos. But it's gonna be about 10 seconds. And think about this. When it's on the screen and done animating, you're gonna want two to three seconds for someone to read it. So it's really about seven to eight seconds of animation. You can have some subtle stuff going on, like uh, glows and soft motion in the background but you want the majority of your logo to be still or have some subtle motion to it. Uh, an example of that would be, let's just say I threw a glow on the 
sanitizer right here for the last three seconds. So I'll set all this to zero. And again, I moved the playhead and I clicked on the stopwatches I wanted to animate. So let's try. There, move forward a little bit. That. And then I'll just zero it all out just for the fun of it. Nothing else is really moving, but I've got like that glowing going on. And this is an extreme example, but I just wanted to show you an example of that's something happening where there's not much else motion on the screen to give some life while, you know, nothing else is moving. So, you know, just something to think about, even though you've got a few seconds with people to read, you could still have other things happening with your logo, giving it some little bit of life to it. Yeah, so I would look at, you know, just watch as many animated intros as you can for uh, company logos for film and TV and, you know, see what inspires you. And then try and break it down, see if you can figure out what they're using. Like if they're using position, scale, rotation, um, and if something inspires you, send me a link to it and I can help you break it down um, before we even learn those skills. I could say, oh, well, they're doing this and I could teach you that skill early so that you can get the work that you want. It's usually the way I work with my students. If they if they want to learn something, I teach it to them as they need to learn it, not have them wait for when it falls during the semester. Any other questions? Yeah, name it. Oh, you mean these over here? These? Okay. Okay, so what I did there was I split the original first layer. Because remember, this is how long it's going to be on the screen, like how long or short. And you could always change that by dragging the ends like that. But just be careful because if there's keyframes, I hit the U key there to show the keyframes. Like if I move this here, that's going to change that motion. Like, if, see how it just instantly pops up there, whereas there's all this motion happening, even though that's not there. So if I trim that layer like that, I just lost all that stuff the viewer is going to see. And next thing you know, that's there. And it makes no sense because it just magically appears. You know what I mean? So be careful. Be careful where your layers start and end because you don't want to go cutting into your keyframes. Yeah, no problem at all. That's all covered under the layer management section, which we'll be getting into. The only reason I split this was so that I could parent these two together and make that little jiggle. It's just faster and easier that way. It keeps them together. Any other questions? Also, while we're on the subject, if you're not seeing what you're seeing here on my screen, there's workspaces up here. So like you could try small screen or standard and you'll see different things pop up. 
that's what happens when you double click. So I'm just going to go to default and keep it this way. And when I click once, that expands it. Clicking on another one closes it. If you don't see something you need, like pretend a line wasn't here, you just go to window and then align. So they're all right here. The ones that are checked off are what's on the screen. So if I don't need to see tracker, I can just close that if I want, give myself some more space. It's up to you to make the workspace that makes the most sense to you, but that's just a little something. Uh, what I would suggest you do is I suggest you save frequently. Adobe crashes a lot. So, you know, just hit command S every now and again. And when you're done uh, animating, I always suggest at the end, after you've saved it, go edit, purge, all memory and disk cache. And see right there, I just ate up 2.7 gigs just from creating the stuff for tonight's lecture. I should say lab. So that builds up on your computer. There's some days when I'm at work and I clear off 90 gigs just from inside of After Effects. So that'll slow down your machine. It'll eat up your storage space. So just make sure when you're done every day, just go edit, purge, all memory and disk cache, and then clear it out. And then you won't have that problem. All right, any other questions? Yeah, see that that way, like if next week you come to me and you're like, oh, you know, I had all these ideas. I could just open them up, take a look at them, you know, because it's it's like picture this. With, there's times I've got like 22 kids in my class. And, you know, I don't have time to download 22 kids work right at the start of class, you know, so if I get it like a half hour before class, I can start downloading stuff. Or if you've got a question to me, before next week, I can look at your files and help you troubleshoot it. Like, uh, let's do something hypothetical here. Let's pretend you animated this. Oops. But We'll pretend you wanted a straight line and you're like, I don't know why this isn't moving at a straight line. Well, I could hit the U key. I could also see from this motion path, I'd say, oh, there's an extra keyframe that's going down and creating that dip. And I hit the backspace to delete it. Now I've got a straight line. See, I'll be able to see your files and help you figure out what went wrong. And you'll be able to learn quicker that way. That's why I encourage you to put everything in Google Drive. Plus, also, if your computer crashes or your drive gets corrupted, you've got everything backed up and you can keep working. Make sense? All right. And another thing that is a common mistake is do not keep caps lock on in After Effects. Like, I'm going to put caps lock on. I just hit it on my keyboard. Look what happens when I drag the playhead to preview my animation. It says refresh disabled, release caps lock. If I click off caps lock, now I can scrub the playhead and preview my animation. Caps lock will not refresh the animation. That's something a lot of students do. So just make sure you turn off caps lock when you're trying to preview your work. Any other questions?
All right. Well, like I said, take the time, start thinking about your logo, come up with a clean, good, well-designed, graphic design looking logo that relates to movie, TV, or film companies and, you know, figure out how you want to animate it. Um, And like I said, doing things with other layers will help. And, you know, the, the more ideas you get to me throughout the week and, you know, help me troubleshoot your work, the better it'll turn out. You don't want to wait to the last second. That's always a recipe for disaster with motion design. Especially when you're just starting to learn it. Any other questions? All right. Well, we'll wrap up early tonight. Great getting to spend some time with everybody. I hope you have a fun semester and you learn a lot. And like I said, just manage your time. Keep on top of things. And, you know, even just draw stuff out with your hand. Take a picture of it. Send it to me. And, you know, I can help you with your storyboarding and, you know, come up with ways to troubleshoot any of your problems you might be experiencing with your animations. All right. Well, have a great weekend, everyone. And like I said, reach out to me through email if you have any questions or concerns and watch the lectures each week. That'll really help you out. Yep, exactly. Quantity over quality. Very well put. It's better to have seven killer seconds of animation than 15 seconds that are boring and unimaginative. You know, and you can definitely get some quality stuff over the next month that you've got to work on this logo. So best of luck everyone this semester and have a great weekend and stay safe during the storm tonight. Yes, yes, it's like Flash. Very good point. And on that note, Flash got renamed Adobe Animate. And when I showed you that video earlier that said there's the bonus material, I've got tutorials on Adobe Animate. So if you want to brush up on that, they're in there. But yeah, this is a lot like Flash, but it's more powerful for motion design. There's no way of adding interactivity. With Flash, you can add interactivity. With this, you can't. But you've got a broader array of effects and animation tools at your disposal. But yes, think about this. You know, um, do this real quick before we go. You can change the, oops, let me hit undo. Move my arrow tool, all right. You can change the layer order like that just by clicking and dragging. So think of it as layers in Photoshop. Now, you can deselect by clicking off or hitting Command Shift A. Wait a second. Control Shift A or Command Shift A, yeah. So that'll deselect, because watch what happens. Here's my circle. If I've got that selected and I try and draw a star, that star is in the same layer as the circle. Sometimes you might want that, sometimes you don't. But if I've got it deselected and I have it its own layer, which is what I wanted to do, I've now got the ability to put this wherever I want in my layer stack in the timeline just like in Photoshop or Illustrator. Oh, and last note, if you're just doing shapes and text and lines, I suggest you do it in After Effects, unless you're really good with gradients and textures in Illustrator, because you'll have to import them in and it will be a big mess. Like there's a pen tool in After Effects and you can use this 
inside of After Effects and you could do so many things to it. Like you can animate it. You could uh, see I just put a wiggle on it. And you could not do that with a path in Illustrator, you know, and there's so many things you could do um, that you'll learn over the semester. Like I could put trim paths on it and have it draw itself on. See like that. And I still have the wiggle going on. So, and the other benefit of using paths in Illustrator, I mean, in Photoshop, not long day. The other benefit of using paths in After Effects, we're teaching After Effects here. Yes, that's what we're doing. There's a path layer right here, and there's a path stopwatch. You can click on that, and I held down shift to deselect that thing. You can not only animate the path points, but you can animate the Bezier curve handles as well. See, like that. Very powerful stuff. That you cannot do if you had your paths drawn in Illustrator. You can give them more life in here. Like such. It's always think about what you want to do. Move the anchor point based on the motion you want. Then move the playhead to where you want that motion to start. Click on the stopwatch that you want to animate. Move your playhead, then make a change. And it looks like I crashed again. It's, it's Zoom. Zoom does not like After Effects very much. All right, so I hope everyone has a great week. And like I said, just email me with any questions or concerns and I will get back to you. And, you know, by the time the first assignments do, everyone should have a pretty decent animation that they can't wait to share on social media. Not a problem. Have a great weekend, everybody, and stay safe tonight. Yep, bye. Bye.